Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Someone said this. It says whoever wrote it was anonymous. They still don't know who wrote it, but I think it's good. Whatever you hold in your mind will tend to occur in your life. If you continue to believe as you have always believed, you will continue to act as you have always acted. If you continue to act as you have always acted, you will continue to get what you have always gotten. If you want different results in your life or your work, all you have to do is change your mind. How many of you want different results in your life? Well, you're not going to get them unless you change your thinking. It's amazing the power of our thoughts. If you think you cannot do something, chances are you will not be able to do it. Your mind has that much influence over you. We have to believe that we can. I can do whatever I need to do in life through Christ who strengthens me. It is impossible to change our lives unless we change our thoughts. Most of us passively that means you're not using your will in any way. Meditate on whatever comes into our minds without ever realizing our enemy, Satan, uses our minds extensively to control and keep us from fulfilling God's destiny for our life. We must not be passive and just sit by and let the enemy fill our minds full of all kinds of wrong thoughts and do nothing about it. So we're trying to teach people to think on purpose. How many of you have gotten at least a little bit better about it in the last couple of days? To begin to think things on purpose. And that's actually what the word meditate means. The word meditate means to choose something that you want to think about and think it about it over and over, roll it over and over in your mind until it becomes a part of you. Let's look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't speak it. It's actually saying it shall be in your mouth and coming out of your mouth all the time. But you shall meditate on it day and night. So here we have the two principles that I'm speaking about, thinking about the word and speaking the word. Meditating on the word, choosing something to think about on purpose, meditating on it, rolling it over and over in your mind and muttering it under your breath, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. So God is saying to Joshua, meditate on the word, speak the word day and night that you may do it. We will never do what we're supposed to do unless we get our mind renewed first because where the mind goes, the man follows. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Don't be so foolish as to think that you're going to have the life that you want to have just because you go park yourself on a church pew every Sunday and listen to somebody else speak the Word. You're going to have to do your part, and that means you're going to have to make the Word of God first place in your life. You love the Word, you live the Word, you make your decisions based on the Word, you meditate on the Word, you speak the Word. As you begin to do that, things begin to change. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then, then when, then after you've spoken it and meditated on it, you shall make your way prosperous. And then you shall deal wisely and have good success. I'd like to look at Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3. The very first Psalm. But his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord. And on his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually... We need to form new habits, don't we? Don't just think whatever falls in our head, but choose what we want to think about and think about it on purpose. He habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and by night 
And he shall be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. You can change your life by letting the Word of God change your mind. Want to look at 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5? I want you to see a few of these scriptures before I get into preaching here. And For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they're mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. And the strongholds he's talking about are mental strongholds. They're areas in our mind where Satan has captured our thinking and walled himself in, and we become deceived in those areas. Inasmuch are with these weapons, the weapons being the Word of God, we refute arguments. The devil will try to argue with you, and theories, and reasonings, <laughs> and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead. Who leads? We lead every thought captive and purpose away captive unto the obedience of Jesus Christ the Messiah. So you can't sit passively by and just think whatever comes in your head. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to make it. I'm just a big failure. I just can't do anything right. Everybody's blessed but me. I'm never going to have any money. Every time I get a little money, something happens to take it. I'll never own my own house. I'll never have my own car. I can never get out of debt. My kids are going to get on drugs. I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. The world's going to pot. What about the economy? Uh, you know, I'm just so scared. I don't... And then go to church on Sunday and say, you need a miracle. Oh, God, God, oh, God, 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 please give me a miracle. Now, I lived like that for a lot of years, so I know what I'm talking about. Change your thinking. Renew your mind. And it'll give you what you need to begin to be more obedient to God. And the more obedient you are to God, the more you're going to see things change in your life. God wants to meet all of our needs abundantly. You may have heard the word prosperity used in the church. I've actually gotten a label as a prosperity preacher, which is about the silliest thing I've ever heard of, like that's the only thing I preach, which it's not. But I do believe that God wants His people to be blessed. And I don't know how you could read the Bible and not think that. I mean, I honestly don't know how you could read the Bible and not think that God wants His people to be blessed. How many of you have children? Do you want them to be blessed? Yes. Is there anybody that you would rather give what you have to other than your children? Well, if we feel like that, how much does God feel like that? I think if there is such a thing as a prosperity preacher, it would be someone who only teaches that and takes the whole message out of balance and out of context. I don't believe that we should ever love money and seek money. I think we should seek God first and foremost in our lives, and He will do what He will give us what we can handle properly. I don't want any more than I can handle properly. And I certainly don't want to be greedy with what I have. I want to, I want to be equipped so I can help people all over the world. But Psalm 35, 27, and I want you to see it so you can never wonder about this again. Psalm 35, 27, let those who favor my righteous cause and have pleasure in my uprightness shout for joy and be glad and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. So I say continually, God takes pleasure in prospering me in my life. And you should be saying it too. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Amen. So, I could stand here and do a four-part series on how abundant God is, 
just looking at the word abundance in the Bible, it's all over the place. God wants your needs to be met. He wants you to be happy where you're at, on the way to where you're going, but he doesn't want you to be satisfied with not having your needs met and think that's some kind of special suffering that you're supposed to do in the Lord's name. Amen? God wants to meet your needs. He wants you to have a good job. He wants you to have a decent place to live. He wants you to be able to have an automobile to get you where you need to go. He wants you to have good friends. He wants you to have a great spiritual life, to know God, to know who He is. God wants us to be blessed in every area of our life, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, and socially. Can anybody say amen? Just because you're not somewhere yet doesn't mean that you shouldn't want to grow. Now, remember what I said. You be happy where you're at because that's part of making progress. If you just barely have enough to get by on, you be happy about it. But while you're there, don't keep saying, I'll never have anything. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. I never have any money. I never have any money. I'll never get out of debt. That's when you need to say continually, let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. I am meditating on the word day and night. I know God loves me. He's going to give me favor. He's going to bless my life, my life. You know, every day I say, God opens right doors for me and he closes wrong ones. God's favor is on my life. Everybody say, God wants to bless me. And I'm willing to take it. All right, the next power thought that I want to talk to you about, which would actually be number nine, so that means we need to do nine, 10, 11, and 12. Some of them I won't have to spend as much time on. I pursue peace with God, with myself, and with other people. Now that's very important to me because I've just come to the point where I don't think life is even worth getting out of bed to face if I can't have peace. And I'm not gonna have peace accidentally, I've gotta have it on purpose. Peace on purpose. 1 Peter 3.11, if we could look at that verse, teaches us that we have to pursue peace. We have to crave it and go after it with all of our might. Let him turn away from wickedness and shun it and let him do right. Let him search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts. And let him seek it eagerly. Do not merely desire peaceful relationships with God, with your fellow man, and with yourself, but pursue and go after them. Three relationships he's talking about here. We have a relationship with God. We need to make sure that we're at peace with God. And it's not difficult to do. The way that you stay in peace with God is you keep sin out of your life. And you do that two ways. You either do the right thing to start with, or when you do make mistakes, you're very quick to repent. You ask God to forgive you. You get the thing taken care of, and that way you can maintain peace with God. You're never going to have peace with God if you're disobeying God. I don't care how hard you try to hide from it. You are not going to have peace with God if way down deep inside, if you're honest with yourself, no matter how many excuses you make for what you're doing, if you way down deep inside know it's something you should not be doing, then you are not going to have peace with God. Amen? And I don't know any way to say that any better than the way that I just said it. When we really want to do something, we can make excuses. Well, everybody else does it. God does not care what everybody else does. He is dealing with you one-on-one. -on -one. And there may be people that you know in your life that can do something and not feel one bit of conviction from God, but God won't let you do it. And you don't need to question that. You just need to know to whom much is given, much is required. And maybe you've asked God for something that they haven't asked God for. And if you want God to do it in your life, then you may have to walk a little more narrow path than they do. Different people get convicted about different things for whatever reasons, and that's one of the things that we've got to get over. Just because everybody else can do something, that don't mean you can do it. 
Hallelujah. And, 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 you don't need to judge them for doing it. Because what happens to people who are seeking to live a holy life, then they think that they're the only ones that are doing it right, and now all of a sudden they've got to judge everybody else who's not doing what they're doing. Leave people alone, pray for them, let God deal with them, and you just make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and everything else will work out all right. Peace with God. The next area that you want to make sure you have peace with is peace with yourself. And I've talked a lot about that. I teach about this a lot because it was a huge problem in my life, and I think it's a huge problem in a lot of people's lives. I had a very difficult time getting along with people, and I wanted to love people. I wanted to be more kind and loving and patient and merciful, and I just couldn't seem to do it. And God finally revealed to me that I couldn't love anybody else because I didn't love myself, and you can't give away what you don't have. That's why I stay on this. You've got to have a right relationship with yourself. You've got to have a right relationship with yourself. And that scripture that I had up proves it. Let's put up 1 Peter 3, 11 again, the last part of that scripture. Do not merely, passively, lazily, I wish I had peace. No, that's not how you get peace. You're going to crave it, pursue it, eagerly go after it with all of your might. You're going to find the things in your life that are stealing your peace, and you are going to get rid of them. Amen? Let's look at the Scripture. Do not merely desire peaceful relationships with God, with your fellow man, and with yourself. Three distinct relationships that he talks about areas where we must make sure that we have peace. So I'm just going to ask you today, do you love yourself? Some of you do, but I could probably almost guarantee there's more people in here who don't than who do. Do you like yourself? Have you accepted yourself? Are you aware of your weaknesses as well as your strengths? And, frankly, you're not all that bothered by them. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have any kind of a loose or a sloppy attitude towards sin. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But some of our weaknesses are not sin. They're just things about us that we wish were different. We wish we could do this thing that somebody else does, but it seems to be such a gift for them and so easy for them. But for us, it's harder. It's much easier for my husband to be calm and easygoing than it is for me. I have to really discipline myself in that area. Well, there's been many times in my life when I've wished that I was like him. I mean, I've told him it must be nice <laughs> to just never have to worry about anything or to even try not to worry. Dave has one answer for every problem, cast your care. When I have a problem, I don't, I don't even go ask him for advice because I already know what it's going to be. Cast your care. And he's right. But it's harder for me to do than it is for him. Well, could we call that a weakness? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, he's stronger in that area than I am. But you know what? I am what I am. You are what you are. I'll just work on that a little bit harder. There's other areas in Dave's life where he has to work a little bit harder. You are no surprise to God. He didn't get you and all of a sudden say, oh my gosh, now look what I'm stuck with. <laughs> the Bible says that God chose you on purpose because He loved you. And he knows the end from the beginning. He's the author and the finisher. Every day of your life was written in his book before you ever breathed one of them. God knows every word in your mouth that you have not spoken yet. He knows every decision you're going to make before you make it. And he still says, I love you unconditionally. I will never give up on you. I will work with you and hold you and watch over you.
So if you've not gotten around to accepting yourself yet, you need to do that. One of the ways that you can have peace with yourself is to not waste your time trying to do things you're not good at. It's sad how many people put about 80% of their energy into trying to improve in areas that they're no good at, rather than spending 80% of their time in the two or three top things that they are gifted in and, and becoming a 10 plus in those areas. I'm good at talking, so I talk. I'm a mouth in the body of Christ and I exercise regularly. Peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with your fellow man. Well, how in the world can you get along with people? Whew, my gosh. Well, number one, don't expect them all to be like you because they won't be. We're all different for a reason. You get in a family unit and you think, how could those two kids have come out of the same place? I mean, they're just like so totally, absolutely opposite. You're like, where did you come from? Another planet? And yet God puts certain gifts in people. He gives us different temperaments because we all need each other. And Satan tries to keep us fighting because he knows better than we do what would happen, the power that we would have if we could ever learn how to be in unity and in agreement. All you got to do is go back and read the book of Acts and you can see when the church was new, when it was young, before there was any time for all the nonsense and the divisions and the denominations and the, all these different things, how powerful the church was. Miracles and raising people from the dead and the lame walking and the deaf hearing and the blind seeing and thousands being added to the church daily. People giving what they had to help everybody else. But you just give people enough time I don't, I mean, sometimes people want me to be part of something and I don't even, I don't even want to get in it because it can be so beautiful in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, somebody's got to be in charge and then this person don't like what the one's doing that's in charge and so now they've got to rise up and be in charge and now they got to take half the group and get them against the other half of the group and I'm just like, I do not have any time for any of that in my life anymore. I'm not doing it. Focus on the good things about people rather than the things you don't like and it'll be much easier to be at peace with them. Learn to adapt yourself to other people. <clears throat> Gives me the creepy crawlies just saying it. The first time I saw that scripture in the Bible that a wife should adapt herself to her own husband, I thought, you have got to be kidding. Tell me you are kidding. <laughs> I had to learn that everything didn't have to go my way and that God in fact delighted at times in making sure I did not get my way so he could watch me and see how I would act. The way we behave under pressure, now listen to me, the way we behave under pressure proves rather or not we're ready to go to the next level. The way we act under pressure, not the way we act when everything's going our way, the way we act under pressure is the proof of whether we're really ready to have the things we're asking God for or not. Okay, let me try that one more time. The way we behave under pressure reveals the real us, who we really are. And it reveals the things in our life that still need to be dealt with. And really, when you get in a tight spot and you act bad, you don't even have to be depressed about it. What you need to say is, well, God, I guess I can still see what we've got to deal with.
Thanks for showing me that. At least I'm not self-deceived. I mean, I would even get to the place where I would thank God. God, thanks for showing me that. At least now I'm not self-deceived and don't think more highly of myself than I ought to. That's exactly why in James 1 it says, be exceedingly joyful when you fall into various trials and temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith brings out patience. You know, the power of our thought life is really, truly amazing. We need to always remember that what we think is going to come out of our mouths, it's going to come out in our actions, it's going to come out in our attitude. So we want to make sure that we're thinking things that are going to really add to our life and not things that are going to draw away from our lives. Well, we're in Rwanda at the Kingdom Education Center where we're being permitted by the grace of God to work with these beautiful children here. And one of the things that they're teaching the children is that the healing of a nation begins with receiving the love of Jesus Christ and by forgiving. That's the way we can help every nation that's hurting, is by teaching them to love God and to love other people. And the best place to start is with the children. Thank you so much for helping us give these children a new life so this can be a brand new nation. God bless you.